Well, bad weather up north changed my plans, but that's okay because look where I ended up. I'm standing at the crossroads. The world famous Devil's Crossroads, the meeting of Highway 61 and 49. Which according to the urban legend, and only really according to the urban legend, is the place where legendary blues man Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil in exchange for being able to play guitar like no one else. And even though this might not be the actual place it happened, if it happened at all, the devil's crossroads here have been symbolically the center of the home of the blues in the Mississippi Delta for years. And as a Delta blues fan myself, it's a place I had to come and check out. Now the Crossroads are located in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And Clarksdale and the surrounding area were home to more blues musicians than any other place. So whether or not they have the actual crossroads where Robert Johnson sold his soul, this place really was the crossroads for all those early Delta blues musicians. Sunhouse, Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters. All of them were either from or made their way through this area. So Clarksdale rightly considers itself the ground zero of the Delta Blues. So fittingly, Clarksdale is not only home to the Ground Zero Blues Club, co-owned by none other than Morgan Freeman, but also the Delta Blues Museum. Home of all kinds of crazy blues artifacts and information. There's about a zillion guitars in there. If you're a blues fan, it's a must-do. Just leave your cameras in the car. Because sadly, photos and video are not allowed. Other than that, though, the museum is awesome. It fills up this whole old train station here. And it's the very station from which which hundreds of old blues musicians made their way out into the wider world, including my favorite blues musician of all, Muddy Waters. In fact, they even have his old house in here. And although we can't film it inside of the museum, we can go check out its original location. You'll have to excuse the bugs all over the window. Today was very much unplanned. But then again, so was the trip that made the place we're going famous. In the early 1940s, there was a guy by the name of Alan Lomax who was roaming the countryside, recording folk music from all over the United States for the Library of Congress. He came out here looking for Robert Johnson and heard, unfortunately, that he had passed away three or four years earlier. But another blues legend, Son House, told him where he could find a kid who could play guitar kinda like Robert Johnson. A kid by the name of McKinley Morganfield, better known as Muddy, who lived out on the old Stovall place. Located about four miles out of Clarksdale. And here it is for blues fans, for even rock and roll fans. This is like sacred ground. It's kind of hard to see now, but on this little raised up portion of ground once stood a cypress log cabin that was originally a home for plantation slaves. Of course, after emancipation, it became a home for workers on the old Stovall plantation. And although it had grown larger than its original one room, this place was where Muddy Waters spent most of the first 30 years of his life. And on this exact site, Alan Lomax made the first ever recordings of Muddy Waters music inside of the four walls of that original cabin. What's crazy is although the roof and all the added on rooms decayed away and were damaged by a tornado, the original core structure still survived. And that building right there is now in the Blues Museum and sometimes travels to other museums from what I'm told. Check this out. There is young McKinley Morganfield, better known as Muddy Waters, right around the time of that first recording made right here on this spot. Well, of course, he was given a copy in the form of a record, which he took down to the local jukebox and sat there listening to it in awe, thinking, oh my gosh, it sounds like all the other real records. I can do it. I can actually do this. It was because of hearing that recording, Muddy Waters decided a life picking cotton and working on the plantation was not for him. And he decided, probably in his house on this corner right here, that he was going to become a professional blues musician. Personally, I didn't discover Muddy Waters until I was in my late 20s, but from the first time I heard his voice, I knew I was a fan for life. You can actually hear the original Muddy Waters recording made on this site. It's known usually as the plantation recordings. It's just Muddy Waters in his living room with an acoustic guitar and it is amazing. Of course, once Muddy decided to become a professional blues musician, he also decided to leave the Mississippi Delta down here and make his way to Chicago from that very train depot where the Blues Museum now is. Chicago, though, was a lot louder than the towns here in the Mississippi Delta. So he swapped out that acoustic guitar for an electric one and became famous for electrifying the Delta Blues. That style and that sound became a massive influence on the 
the Rolling Stones, Chuck Berry, the Beatles, countless early rock and roll musicians. And as Eric Clapton says right here on this plaque, Muddy Waters music changed my life. And whether you know it or not, or like it or not, it probably changed yours too. Man, talk about ground zero. I can't believe that I am actually standing out here where Muddy Waters' first recordings were made. This is a super big deal for me. I know there are some people out there who are like, okay. And I know a lot of the young kids these days with their Skrillex and their hip hop music probably don't care a lot about this. But I don't just film stuff because I think it's gonna be popular or gonna go viral. I explore the things that I am passionate about and I have to tell you, this was a major bucket list item for me. Muddy Waters hooked me into the blues forever. If you never listened to him, I highly recommend the Blue Sky Trilogy, the last three albums he made in his life, especially I'm Ready. What a great album, you can get it on iTunes, it rules. But for the recording made here, search for the plantation recordings. I believe that's what they're called. Now don't forget, we're talking about some serious segregation times back in the early 1940s, back in the 30s when all the Delta Blues was getting started. The African American community down here was very segregated and very isolated, which is how the blues developed. Before modern farm equipment, it took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to work the fields on these big plantations or farms. So you had entire Hire vast communities of people who were pretty much left to their own devices and came up with their own entertainment and famously the Delta Blues was born. Stovall's place was pretty cool to visit but perhaps no other farm on earth can claim as much blues credit as this place behind me, Dockery Farms. This was well known for miles and miles around for being a place where you could work and be pretty much left to your own devices afterwards. The Dockeries were known for giving their workers a square deal and in 1900 this place became the home of none other than Charlie Patton, a very famous and very influential early blues man. Rather than doing a lot of heavy lifting in terms of farm work, Charlie Patton was known to make his living playing the blues here for all the workers after they kicked off for the day. Actually, because of that, he was threatened to be kicked off of Dockery Farms a few times, you know, for being a loafer. But I guess the music was just too good because he mainly stuck around here playing shows with legendary musicians like Willie Brown, Tommy Johnson, and Sun House. I guess those names don't mean a lot to some people, but that was basically the first crop of really locally famous blues musicians. These are some of the guys who more or less invented what we now think of as the Delta Blues. It was their playing right here at Dockery Farms that inspired the next generation of musicians, including, of course, the famous Robert Johnson. Actually, according to some versions of the legend, it was that older generation who made fun of how bad of a musician Robert Johnson was, which is the reason he went to the crossroads and sold his soul to the devil. Dude, check this out. We are inside of the old Dockery Farms cotton gin. This is pretty wild. Just think all those people who worked in the cotton gin a hundred years ago would knock off after work, go to the juke joint built on the place, listen to some people playing the blues. All these old buildings at Dockery are just kept open like this. You can just pull up and sort of walk through from dawn till dusk. It's all just kept here for blues fans and history fans of course too. Just park your car up against the highway and you can wander around at your leisure. Dude, check this out. I was just told by a guy that's wandering around taking care of the property that right here on the porch of this little presumably storage building or something like that, right here is one of the places Charlie Patton and those other early blues musicians would play. Patton himself learned from an older guy here named Henry Sloan. And here's a name that might be a little more familiar to you among the many, many people who either passed through or grew up or lived or worked here. Was none other than Howlin' Wolf himself. Real name Chester Arthur Burnett. And just like Sun House and Robert Johnson, it was the sound of the blues from Dockery that he would send screaming out to the rest of the world that would inspire countless musicians and of course guitar players everywhere, including almost every rock legend you can think God. Dockery doesn't get as much press as some other places, but this place is legit. And perhaps much more than any other single locality truly deserves the title of the birthplace of the blues. I mean, I don't know if you guys are music fans, but if you are, this place is like sacred ground or something. It's the perfect place to walk around listening to some Sun House or Charlie Patton or Howlin' Wolf, which I'm doing in between shots. But obviously thanks to copyright issues I can't do in this video. However, if you have some old school blues handy, pop it on. Cause it's highly likely that whatever song you're jamming was once performed right 
out here. Dude, this is so perfect. The only thing I'm missing right now is a guitar. I never was much of a guitar player, and I haven't played in a long time. But I'd love to have a guitar in my hands right now here at Dockery. Dude, this is absolutely nuts. Sunhouse, Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson, Howlin' Wolf. They were all right here. Here. It's crazy because they don't get that much tourism down in this area of Mississippi. Some of the people at the museum were saying they think most people are afraid to come down here. But in my experience down here so far, even though nobody wants to be on camera, everyone I've met has been super friendly, holding an open door, stopping to chat, telling me stories about their grandparents growing up here, working on these places. Other than being powerful, warm, and swelteringly hot, this is actually a wonderful place to come and visit. I've heard more blues stories today from people than my feeble brain knows what to do with. Anyway, if you're a blues fan or a rock and roll fan, get yourself out here to Dockery if you ever have a chance. And come and pay tribute, literally if you have the cash on you, to one of the most important places in music history. Alright, speaking of boogieing, I better get out of here. But before I leave Mississippi, there's one more blues stop I've got to make. Man, all these fields just stretch on for mile after mile out here. And it's hot as heck under this blazing sun and there's bugs everywhere. And then back then, before the civil rights era, to have to deal with Jim Crow and segregation and being treated so poorly. The people that invented this music had a hard life. I've noticed a lot of really good art comes from people that had hard lives. Of course, it was so miserable down here that millions of people migrated up north where there were more, you know, manufacturing jobs, better living conditions. And that's how the Delta Blues started to spread to so many urban areas. We're talking well before the era of people like Elvis Presley adopting that sound. Delta Blues musicians started traveling and performing all over. Even back in the early days though, I mean there's so much distance between each one of these towns that to perform in numerous places required quite a bit of traveling, which is why even from the beginning to be a blues man was to be a rambling man. And perhaps no single person best personifies the legendary bluesman than Robert Johnson. Who, according to legend, was one of the charter members of the 27 Club dying at age 27, supposedly after being given poisoned whiskey. And even though there are at least three locations that he was supposedly buried at, most people now agree the best evidence places his body here at the Little Zion Missionary Baptist Church, which is just a little over a mile away from the place where he was supposedly poisoned. And according to Miss Rose Eskridge, an eyewitness, his grave was dug here at the base of this old pecan tree. And here it is. This headstone was obviously placed here a long, long time after the fact. But you can see people have left all kinds of crazy tributes out here. Mainly in the form of guitar picks and a hooch, both of which I guess are somewhat fitting tributes. At least from a sort of rock and roll point of view. Because of segregation at the time, this is one of the few places that he could have been buried. And that along with the testimony of Miss Rose, plus the fact that he was supposedly poisoned just over there in town means it's very likely that we're in the right place. Wow, look at that there with the lyrics from one of his songs. And then on the other side over here, we have a facsimile of a handwritten note kept by the family of Robert Johnson himself that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of Jerusalem, I know that my Redeemer liveth. He will call me from the grave. Now, at the time he was playing music, playing that secular devil music was not a popular choice among the respectable. That combined with not exactly being an angel is probably what led to the whole sold my soul to the devil legend. There's actually a pretty good documentary about Robert Johnson that just recently went up on Netflix called Devil at the Crossroads. It is definitely worth watching. This guy had a hard and pretty tragic life. No one knows for sure whether or not Robert Johnson is actually buried in this this cemetery. But it's possible and even probable that here lies what some say is the greatest guitar player of all time. As you can see, this church here doesn't look exactly active. It's fallen on some pretty hard times, so it's important to drop some cash in the donation box for the upkeep, not just of Robert Johnson's grave, but also this historic black cemetery out here. Some of the stones out here are just hand-painted, but many of the graves here are of people who couldn't afford a headstone at all and so still lie unmarked, just like Robert Johnson's used to for years and years. Is that a coffin sticking out of the ground or just an elaborate headstone. Definitely a very unusual grave and all of the graves out here are just within a stone's throw of the river. It's a very peaceful, very beautiful place. Quite a contrast with the wild and crazy life of Robert Johnson. But anyway, even if this isn't actually his grave, it's pretty cool that they put this headstone here so that now there's somewhere to come and pay 
our respects. All right, gang. Well, I think that's going to do it for me. This was all unplanned and sort of happened on the random. And now it's getting pretty late. The sun is going down. And I've got to get to a meeting later at the crossroads. So I think for today, we've done our duty. Time to go home and sleep well. Before I go, though, I would just like to read you a quote from one of Robert Johnson's songs. Baby, I don't care where you bury my body when I'm dead and gone. You may bury my body down by the highway side so my old evil spirit can get a greyhound bus and ride. And now it's time for us to ride down the highway to our next adventure. Check out the links down below. Thank you guys for coming with me on this very random trip to the home of the blues. I'll see you all a little later. Bye bye. <laughs>
on this street right here. Kind of a rundown, sketchy-ish part of town. So I guess they just want to keep traffic moving, but I keep circling and just stopping for a few minutes to check it out. Sometimes the rules were made to be bent a little. Oh yeah, 508 Park Avenue, a huge piece of music and for this area, movie history. Okay, one more touch. A little bit of a knock there. And now I really gotta go. There's a hellhound on my trail. Time to go home and sleep well. 